Hey, welcome to another podcast. My guest today is Alexandra Schwen, who lives in South Africa. Um, she's a proponent of detoxing the body, and her main focus is on physical health. So that's mostly what we talk about here, how to maintain a healthy body. So like I said, she's into detoxing. It's really all about removing obstruction from the body, is how, how she puts it. And there's a number of different methods you, one can use to do this. So we talk about things uh, such as fasting, even enemas, um, but even just eating more fruit and vegetables. She sort of um, gives a lot of credit to fruit and vegetables <laughs> as being the, the, the things that scrub and clean the body. Whereas when we eat animal products, even totally organic, fresh chicken eggs that I have going on in my backyard here, even those are going to leave a lot of waste material in the body that has to be um, cleaned up and released somehow. So we talk a lot about that and um, I found it fascinating even as someone who I really I do eat a lot of meat and I eat a lot of uh, eggs and and things like that a lot of animal products. Um, I've been eating more fruit ever since talking to Alex. I'm really I think she's onto something. I don't think she's the only one who who's onto this either but um, yeah it's fascinating. She's a great speaker as well. Super knowledgeable. Uh, thanks Alex for talking to me. Uh, it was awesome and we also of course talk about psychedelic drugs a little bit. Um, Alex has experience herself with psilocybin mushrooms. So near the end of this one, we get into that subject and uh, her thoughts on how they can help people and how she's actually working with people with psilocybin mushrooms currently. And um, yeah, gives a lot of credit to those. So it was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy it. This is me with Alexandra Schwinn. It's about love, not cash Stealing money from the poor's a bit rash Line your pockets, fill your tanks with your rockets Look at it, we just can't stop it Loving your neighbour with bombs is wrong Loving your neighbour with bombs is wrong Just don't be complete That's the only rule Loving your neighbour with bombs is wrong Loving your neighbour with bombs is wrong I've been going on way too long I want to start with this story. Um, it's about cleaning up my shop, right? So this summer I had a lot of projects going on. We just bought a house and I had, I built a chicken coop in the backyard. We built a, what we call here an Arctic entranceway. It's like a mud room, a little entranceway into the house. So we built that. We, I had a whole bunch of renovation things going on. So we had a lot of construction going on, a lot of building. And I have this shop that ended up being just like sort of everything got dumped in the shop. So all the scrap materials got dumped in there all the tools that we used. I had other people working with me and they just sort of put my tools in the shop and boxes and things. Nothing was really organized. And it, I knew come like uh, fall, I was going to have to clean my shop. I knew this was coming. I was kind of just putting it off until the fall. So around September, October, I got in there and I had to clean it. And it was a huge mess in there. There was this, you know, siding and soffit and scrap lumber and things all over the floor. And then on my workbench was covered in tools just boxes of tools and everything in there was covered in like a layer of sawdust as well. So everything was just, it was a complete mess and it was intimidating to try to clean it. So I went in and I started just, you know, on the workbench. I thought, okay, I'm going to, one thing at a time. It's the only way you can get anything done. Pick up one thing, put it away. So I started, I picked up a hammer, you know, put it where the hammers go, but there was something else where the hammers go. So I had to move something else out of the way, I had to wipe everything off and as I went, I started getting more distracted. You'd pick up one thing, then another thing you'd have to move. And you, and I, pretty soon, I decided there's no way I'm going to do this. What I have to do is first remove everything off of the bench. I got to take all the tools, get them off of there, just clean the whole area, wipe the whole thing down, get the sawdust off, and then start reintroducing things where they're supposed to go once everything's clean. And when I did that, <laughs> when I realized that's the easiest way to clean it, to me, it was a sort of a metaphor for how also detoxing the body because I was listening to a lot of your things that you were putting out at the time too. And it just kind of struck me as it's funny that that was the best way to do it. First, I had to remove everything and then I could reintroduce things in a clean, healthy kind of a way. So I thought we could start maybe with that as a metaphor, talking about detoxing the body. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, I think the majority of people, me included, before I learned what I learned, you know, we come from the school of thought that we need to add, 
Yeah. More is better. And with nutrition, you know, I mean, I've studied nutrition for 20 years, all kinds of ramification of nutrition from Ayurveda to Chinese medicine to bodybuilding diet and mm. all of that. And so I also came from the school of thought that more is better and adding, 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 taking, taking, taking supplements, the newest superfoods right. and all of that, yeah. that's where it was at. And I kept doing that. You know, I bought stuff, I bought supplements the way other women buy shoes and dresses. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, I would import them from all over the world and I would chase them down and the latest, but nothing was really shifting in my body. And the older mm. I got, so when I was 39, I sort of just really started feeling so completely run down and then mm. things started to accelerate until my body felt completely depleted and sort of I had this huge health crisis at my hands and I thought, how did this happen? Mm. I thought I knew everything. I thought I was doing it all right. You're going down the right path, you thought, yeah. Yes. And, and that's when I kind of similarly, you know, like the analogy of, okay, let's eliminate everything right let's really strip it down and that was where i learned about what true detoxification really means and that you know the little detoxifications of a week juice fasting means nothing mm. or you know eliminating a few foods means nothing if you really want to strip down your body if you really want to start detoxing the body you need to start from kind of ground zero almost you need to strip down to skin and bones i mean i'm exaggerating mm -hmm. but essentially that is what we're doing with right. detoxification that seems to be your uh, like the biggest message i see from you on say instagram or things like that is this idea of just cleaning things out and getting like you're, you're a bit you're very much a proponent of fasting and uh, i've tr we yeah. my girlfriend and i tried that um we tried it twice and I, I have very little experience with this. I've never fasted before. So we just did a fast for a day, um, two times on a Saturday, you know, the only day we had available that we could possibly do it. And it was pretty challenging. I'll say that much. It was hard not to eat all day. That's, you know, you can just say like, oh yeah, I fasted for a few days, but man, that is challenging to do it. Um, and I knew going in, what I had read about was that we should be busy, right? Don't just sit around the house like, board because that's <laughs> going to be even harder. So we kept fairly busy when we did it. Um, we had little projects to do. So we, we worked on stuff and we knew we were going to be a little bit irritable. So we were just very kind to each other as, as we went and that was helpful. Um, but I would say, yeah, the evening was very difficult to not eat. Um, and, but we found after the first day we did it, we found the following day we had a very high amount of energy it was it was actually odd we weren't expecting it we found we felt really yeah. great and light uh that first uh day afterward which was interesting the second time we did it i think maybe we were like expecting that a little too much we were like oh yeah we're gonna feel so great th after this and we didn't it wasn't really the same energy level after the second week we tried it um but it was interesting i, I really enjoyed the uh, fasting just mentally the um, sort of learning about what it is to be really hungry and that that feeling that desire we have that when when you get so hungry the the cravings like just the the mad craving to just eat is it's very hard to overcome and so fasting was an interesting experiment at the very least for me um but maybe you could talk a little bit about your practice with fasting because I know you do a lot more than just fast for a day yes <laughs> so i mean again you know the 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 focus for me for detoxification is all around removing obstruction. And that is what I teach people that nutrition has actually nothing to do with adding and it's got everything to do with subtracting. And it's not about subtract because subtracting what not subtracting nutrition, hmm. but subtracting obstruction from the body. Hmm. And we need to understand that really 95% of the food, and I couldn't believe that for years, you know, it took me quite a long time to really kind of get my head around this because initially what I now consider natural, I started out considering way extreme. Hmm. So, you know, it was a journey of learning and unlearning, 
but what I've learned on this journey is that really 95% of the foods that we tend to consume and certainly 95% of the foods that we can buy at the supermarket are not really even made for human consumption. And that strictly speaking, what we should consume, at least you know, 80 to 90% of the foods that we should be consuming on a daily basis is really fruit, vegetables, and then the rest we can sort of leave at whatever. Hmm. So whatever you said, you you said like. eighty to ninety percent. Is that what you said? Yes, eighty to ninety percent of fruit. And, so, so what comes up for me right away when I hear that is like, what about getting enough calories? Like just getting enough to sustain physically and to be if you're an active person if you live in a cold climate like I live in a cold climate where I think you need a little bit more calories I don't know and also just the idea like fruit doesn't really grow here that well either so but now yeah. obviously we can get shipments of fruit it's not that you know the grocery stores are full of fruit and veggies so it's not really an issue um, but yeah what about just just calories well, calories, you know, another thing I've learned calories in is not equal calories out. And it actually calories, again, don't mean it's not all about calories and that the mm. body can really adapt and you want it for longevity purposes. You want mm -hmm. your body to adapt to actually have a slow metabolism. You know, mm. I've spent certainly the first part of my life trying to do everything in my power to speed up my metabolism as right. most women and as most people for weight loss and then i've learned say again for weight loss yes well for weight loss and also because it was like well i love eating so if <laughs> i have a high metabolism <laughs> you could eat more I can eat a lot of food <laughs> right and not gain weight yeah. you know i mean that is how we think that's how most women think right and until I found out that actually having a high metabolism means you also age faster because naturally we are running this motor, you know, like a car. If you continuously mm. rev it, rev it, mm. rev it, yes, it burns. Right, right. But it kind of also, you know, it's It'll got burn a shorter out. lifespan. Mm. Right. So that sort of, you know, really also shifted my thinking. And, and the reality is that we can train our body to become a lot more efficient. And there again, as same thing as with a car, right? If the, if the fuel filter, I mean, not that I know about cars, but you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the basics, if the fuel filter is clogged up, if you know, the, right. the um, engine and so forth is clogged up, it's mm -hmm. not going to run efficiently. It's going to guzzle yeah. more gas. It's going to take more maintenance. But if everything is clean and pure, mm -hmm. you need a lot less fuel and you right. need, you don't need much else. You know, it's just going to drive. It'll and so the yeah. same thing goes for the body. That when we have a clean body, we need less food and fuel and it's going to run much more efficiently, meaning it's going to take everything that you give it and utilize it. Obviously, if it's good food. Mm -hmm. Um, right. so ideally, you know, obviously it is, it's true in your climate, you would need to adapt mm -hmm. and you would need to have slightly higher fat intake. You would need to have a little bit more grains that are less mucus forming right. or non mucus forming. But, um, you know, even there with detoxification, I mean, one, there's, there's one path, which is about cleaning out the body mm -hmm. and the most efficient way to cleaning out the body, to stripping it down, to removing obstruction is through fruit and vegetables, but higher tending to be higher on the fruit because fruit mm -hmm. are the scrubbers of the body, whereas the greens are the broom. Hmm. So the green, the, the fruit is what scrubs the body out and removes all the dirt from the corners hmm. and then you come with the greens to sweep it out of the body like so greens being like high in fiber kind of idea to like get yes. things moving i don't know <laughs> yeah basically basically um so what we do to heal the body to bring the body back to balance and to remove obstruction from the body is going to be different to what we do once we are healed, once we mm. are freed of obstruction right. to maintain.
Right. So I was going to ask you about that, this idea of is detox a state that we should be in all the time or is sort of detox something we should be focused on early on and then later it becomes more of a once in a while type of thing that we're actually detoxing our bodies? Or is it something, right. should it be a state we're in, yeah, all the time? Yeah, I think that's a great question because a lot of people get so confused with that. Yeah. Rightfully so. And, you know, in my experience, I mean, we think, no, normally we think a detox of two weeks or a month detox is right. like, wow, that's <laughs> big. Yeah, yeah. And what I've learned is that to truly detox the body, and, you know, it's for marketing purposes, it's not the right thing to say. Hmm. But I always am honest. It takes at least two or three years of constant progressive effort wow. to really, truly clean out the body. That is not what people want to hear. I know that much. No, <laughs> that's not what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. And... In fact, you know, the whole truth is that it actually takes longer because we have to think our whole body, it takes seven years for every cell to right. turn around. Yeah, I've heard that. Right. Plus an additional two years for our energetic body to also be completely renewed. Hmm. So, and I'm experiencing that. You know, look, the good news is that when you start the detoxification process, first of all, at the beginning, there is what I call the honeymoon period. Mm. And so typically you'll start the detox and within six, seven, eight, nine days, people will message me and say, oh my goodness, Alex, I'm feeling so incredible. <laughs> right. People are feeding back to me that I look amazing. I'm shining. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and then give it another week or two. And then they start saying, oh, my goodness, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm starting to, yeah. you know, have all these effects. Well, the honeymoon is over. Right. It's a long haul. And all the stuff that has that has been hidden and cemented, truly cemented into the body, mm -hmm. into our sponges tissue, slowly starts coming up. Hmm. And when, and that's not always, depending on degrees of toxicity, it's not always an easy process. It's not always a pretty process. It's not always a comfortable process. Right. And, you know, also there, I typically say, unless you have suffered enough or unless you have really cognitive understanding of how the body works, people are not going to be ready to go hmm. into deep detoxification mode. Hmm. And that is why like... I offer, you know, a quick three day detox. I offer a month of detox hmm. so that people can dip their toes and just right. get a, an inkling of a feeling of what's possible. Right. I see. And also more importantly to see that actually it's not that difficult. Like once you've passed your first three days, whether it's a fast or of detox, it's not that difficult mm. on a physical level. <laughs> As you have discovered, the most difficult part of detoxification, especially once you start going for longer mm -hmm. and of fasting, certainly, is the mental and emotional aspect. Yeah. And that is simply because we are all emotional eaters, whether we mm -hmm. know it or not. Yeah, and that was a good learning experience for me by trying uh, fasting for sure to learn that I am emotionally uh, driven to eat certain foods and, and to uh, uh, satisfy certain cravings for sure. Yeah. Um, I, th I would say like thinking about this stuff, what I want personally for me, I just want to feel light. I want to feel, I want to have energy and not, because I've noticed eating certain foods especially i just had a conversation with someone about eating like things like pizza like we we're talking about cheese and and wheat and things and how if you're eating something like that you can't have any plans for the rest of the day you just crash it's just puts you to sleep Completely. and I, i'm just tired of that i'm really sick of having meals and then having not being able to do anything later and i was thinking just about the idea of fasting and how the evening was very difficult but i could see myself trying to do a periodic I guess people call it like intermittent fasting where I could see myself fasting 
in the 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 morning and afternoon okay and then just having a meal later on because at least then because when I notice when you're when you're actually in a fasted state you do have energy you're 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 hyper sort of aware and you're it was funny too I had sort of thoughts that maybe um, once I was fasting I wouldn't be able to sort of concentrate well enough I wouldn't be able to do things but that wasn't the case I was doing we were doing construction projects while we were fasted in the house and we were doing all sorts of stuff that required sort of computing and thinking about things and then physical work and things and it was okay we were fine and that was uh not what I had expected I, I, I thought maybe I'd start to get lightheaded and feel foggy and you know but that yeah that wasn't the case at all yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's been my experience also when I, my first fast, I just jumped right in into the deep end and I did 40 days. 40? 40 days. Wow. Okay. And <laughs> Jeez. obviously I was also majorly motivated by the fact that I, I felt like shit. Right. And nothing was working. And so I thought, okay, let me just do this, dive in. Hmm. And... Yes, there were some moments of weakness, but ultimately, overall, I had a lot more energy than I had experienced for years. Mm. And when I, you know, and now, obviously, now that I'm four years into this process and I periodically fast and I'm constantly stripping away and rebuilding, I have more energy than I actually ever recall having. Mm. Because I remember, even as a child, I was constantly tired. Mm. Obviously, I grew up in Italy, so I was literally brought up on bread, cheese, <laughs> right. later, wine, pizza, mm. pasta, you know. Right. So constantly these foods that sort of really make you groggy and sleepy. So I remember even as a 12-year-old, I was slow. Mm. I was slowed down and I remember looking at other kids that were sort of hyper because that is the other possibility, you know, depending on whether you are more acidic or lymphatic, mm. then you will, your th this bad food will affect you in a different way. Right. Both are detrimental to our health, but the one looks better, mm. whereas the other one <laughs> looks worse because when you're lymphatic, you slow down when you're sit more acidic your body sort of starts burning uh, and churning away. And these are like these people that are like super hyper, but actually they are completely de depleting their adrenal system. Oh, uh, you know? yeah, yeah, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah. So when you do a 40 day fast, uh, are you, you're drinking water at least? You gotta be, there's no way you can do that without drinking water. No, in this particular fast that I did, um, there's no drinking water, it's actually, dry fasting on a daily basis for 18 hours so say from about 7 p.m until the next day 12. okay and then uh breaking the fast so it's called the master fast system mm. and um breaking the fast with grape juice okay and so it's grape juice herbal tinctures and then some binders to bind the toxins that are being released. Hmm. And that is it. So you drink grape juice in a six hour window and you take your herbs and binders and that is it. I see. Okay. So you have something at least to hydrate the system, a bit of juice and then something, it's, I guess, to, like you say, bind things or pull things from you and clean it out as you go. That's right. Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, let me see. The other one thing you mentioned was uh, mucus in foods, and that's something you seem to mention a lot in a lot of what you put out as well. Uh, maybe you could talk to me a little bit about why foods that create mucus are are bad for people. Right. Well, obviously, mucus is is sort of the basis, really, of any disease because we must think foods that create mucus are essentially all animal products all glutinous fr uh, foods, so your wheat and oats and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, rice also to a degree, especially white rice, because when you cook it, the more you cook it, the more glue <laughs> it becomes. Uh, yeah, that's true. So anything that sort of, you know, becomes a gluey paste mm -hmm. <laughs> when we cook it and when we feel it in our hands, we yeah. must just imagine what does it do when we ingest it? Right. So you need to build up mucus in order to move that through your system. Well, it's not so much move it through the system. The mucus is actually there 
to create a barrier between hmm. the toxicity of the food and your organs. It's just it's a it's it's basically an autoimmune response of the body. Hmm. It's the body saying, "Ooh, danger." There's food here that I don't know what to do with. Let me create a barrier between my precious organs and these foods. So what do you mean for toxicity so, in the foods? What sort of toxicity do these have? The the glue itself. So the hmm. fact that it's not it's not a a nutritious food. It's it's um you know like even in the I mean obviously all animal products they're complex proteins mm -hmm. which the body you know as much as we think oh but we need protein to build muscle mm -hmm. we don't need protein we need amino acids right yeah because when we give a piece of meat to the body the body first has to break that down into amino acids mm -hmm. to actually utilize it right and then about 68% of all animal products that we ingest is actually toxicity nitrogen i uh, forget the word now but it's it's nitrogen residue basically that gets left behind in the body so you're creating waste by eating animal products versus when you eat um plant-based protein like legumes even though they still are mucus um forming but not nearly as mucus forming as animal products Okay. And there you get left with a residue of about 18%. So 68% versus 18% in 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 the plant plant-based proteins. Mm -hmm. So that 68% of residue needs to be metabolized, need like the body needs to do something with it. Mm -hmm. And the thing is the body cannot break all of that down because it simply is too much Good. and at the same time because we t generally keep ingesting every day more and more and more it's not like we have you know protein or something mucus forming once a week mm -hmm. which would mean well, well there's enough time for the body to break that down right we are constantly typically ingesting three mucus forming meals a day <laughs> yeah you know which is complete insanity and so no wonder that we have no energy when we consider mm. that it takes about six to eight hours for the body to break down um proteins or complex carbs right versus fruit which takes 40 minutes to an hour depending on what fruit and how much you know and then it's through the body and similarly mm. with vegetables maybe two hours depending on what combination so there again is where does our energy go? Our, all mm. of our energy goes constantly into digestion. And that is why we have no energy for creativity, for life, for movement, for right. being present to life. Right. So you're talking about things being more efficient. Just, it's just being more efficient for the body to break down plant material than it is animal tissue and things. And that the mucus maybe is just a sign that that food is just going to take a lot of energy to break down. It's not like the mucus itself is necessarily bad for you. It's just sort of a, a symptom of trying to digest that type of food. Completely. And yet, obviously, the, the mucus is bad in the sense mm. that it gets formed as this protective layer. But then because the body doesn't generally tend to get a break, because like I said, we tend to eat constantly mucus forming foods. Mm. So then eventually this mucus that doesn't get um an outlet it simply starts building up in the body and eventually it starts hardening hmm. and when ah. you think about it, we all know what mucus looks like and feels like now mm -hmm. and we all know what it looks like when it hardens mm. from our nose yeah when you get a cold now, or something yes so now imagine all this mucus in our organs in the kidneys in the liver in the lungs mm. in the colon and we're slowly over the years, layer by layer, it starts forming a lining around mm. the colon, around huh. the gut, around, you know, in the kidneys. Right. That is really what obstruction is. So if you're, and yeah, if you're talking about detox um, and how it can be uncomfortable, just imagining these things that have been formed in our body breaking down and then having to release out of us some way that probably isn't going to feel that great necessarily as you feel your body breaking itself down and, and changing physically. Completely. Yes. No, I mean, it's, it's actually quite a radical 
process. Um, you know, in a, in a sense, luckily or unluckily, I'm sort of like, I just throw myself into things mm -hmm. and then I ride the wave and it <laughs> comes. Yeah. But there were certainly times when I was doing my, when I was going through my detoxification process where I thought, oh shit, I've done it. You know, <laughs> this is the uh, end of me. Right. Um, so I, I want to talk about, um, more about this idea of, of release. I want to get into that. Um, but I think first, for me, the idea of sort of going through a detox, it's intimidating because I don't know how to do it and it seems complicated. It just seems like a lot of effort. And I was wondering if you can try to help me break down a very simple way to go about this process for people. Someone like me who doesn't have a whole lot of experience, but what are some steps I can take and some some practices I can develop because obviously we're talking about a long term type of thing here. Um, so yeah. what are sort of the first steps that I can take here? So, I mean, you know, just to briefly go back, cause you said, do you constantly need to detox? Mm. And I think the biggest thing to understand with detoxification and with the way that I teach it is to understand that it is all about removing obstruction from the body right and if the obstruction has oftentimes been there even before birth you know we've been born with obstruction wow <laughs> yes you know and i mean i like i thought and probably other people also i thought that when you were born you were pristine yeah that's when I you're at your pristine. purest yes and then i had to realize you know through this process and through the learning that no actually we're not born pristine and at most of us, because our parents ate just as bad, you know, mm -hmm. maybe not quite as bad, but they still ate stuff that was not meant for human consumption on a daily basis mm. and their grandparents and so forth. And so we are all born with this obstruction. Right. So it's important to understand. And I find that's really like the biggest obstacle for people to understand how far we actually have veered from nature mm. and that therefore, and now it's more important than ever because now it's not just the food toxicity that we've been exposed through to, but there is environmental toxicity that we also are constantly being exposed to. Beauty products, no matter how expensive we think we're putting stuff on our face, all contains toxicity. So toxins are right. coming at us from all angles. Right. And part of that is normal. Our bodies are designed and equipped to fight things off. It seems you're more just talking about not like giving them a break and like not giving them constantly things to fight off, but and being aware of that and being aware of the stress we're putting on our bodies. Right. Well, and it's also understanding that our bodies, you know, actually, yes, as much as they were made to fight off, but were they made to fight off all this toxicity that we're exposing it from all angles? Yeah. And knowing what I know now, I can tell you that, and I'm still not super pristine. I almost make a point to every now and again have some so-called mucus forming or poisonous foods hmm. so that I can kind of, you know, I don't become too pristine <laughs> basically so that I can still cope you know, with yeah. life right. because I'm not ready to go live. I mean, yes, we live in South Africa and things are pretty pristine here, but you know, I'm not ready to live in the hills of Kauai and <laughs> sort of just, you And know. shut off from the system. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I need to and want to operate in life. So I'm aware that I don't want to become too clean so that then I become too sensitive right, yeah. to everything. And so I still expose myself, but I can tell you that I've never, I know I have never operated in such a clean body as I have now after four years of detoxification and it's a whole new life. Hmm. So yeah, so that's because appealing. what I'm discovering. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a whole new life. And, and that for me is really where the whole fascination with detoxification comes in because it's not just the body, it's the level of consciousness mm. that evolves out of a clean body. 
And so, you know, I mean, I've been on also a whole spiritual path for the last 20 years and I kept doing so much work on myself, sacred medicines and meditation and working with shamans and working with gurus. Mm. But oftentimes I felt like, gee, I'm doing all this work, but it's kind of as if it's not touching sides because I fall back into my old matrix. Right. Why is that? Until I started cleaning out my body and literally working on myself on a cellular level. So cleaning out the cellular waste and cellular memory Hmm. and replacing it with new pristine information. And that is where everything started to align Hmm. and where all the work that I was doing on myself spiritually started to stick. Hmm. So I've had a couple conversations and this is going a little bit, now I'm getting a little bit... uh a little bit out there, but so I've had a couple, a couple of chats with people about this idea that consciousness, um, it doesn't exactly develop from the brain or from our bodies, but that we're sort of antennas that pick up a frequency. And, and to me, it Completely. kind of speaks to this idea that if you can dust off and clean up the antenna, you're going to pick up a better frequency. You're going to get a higher level of, of consciousness in some way, or however that works. Um, but let's go back to some just to simplify this idea because it's appealing like what you're saying right now i'm like yes i want to get there that sounds great you know but how what are some steps that i can take some really just practical things that i can do now to get there sure so what i recommend for people is simply start by removing all animal products Hmm. and i know that that sounds simple (laughs) and again i don't come I did not come to veganism and I'm not even a hundred percent vegan, you know, about 95, 98%. I didn't come to veganism from a political or emotional perspective. I simply Mm -hmm. came to it from an understanding that there is no way that you can heal and regenerate your body at a cellular level with animal products. And I've experienced that myself. I've tried for years to still have a little bit of eggs, a little bit of fish, and to, and it wasn't working for me. And I realized hmm. that the minute that I left out all animal products, that is when things really started to shift for me. Hmm. So leaving out all animal products is step number one. And simply becoming there also conscious that when you do consume animal products, if you really feel, and it's never a physical need, never. Hmm. It's only ever an emotional need. And so if you do have the emotional need to have some animal products to then be very conscious where they come from and to sort of choose the cleanest source possible, Mm. as wild as possible, as natural as possible, as uncontaminated as possible. Mm -hmm. We've, so I've experimented with that. Um, I've been experimenting myself with diet changes and things because I've, and we, you know, we watch a few documentaries, say on like Netflix, these things that show how um, cows and chickens are being abused. And it's a, and we saw my girlfriend especially had an emotional uh, response and a reason for trying not to eat that stuff. And what we've kind of done is because we live where we do, um, we have access to like say moose meat, um, wild salmon, and stuff. So we have been trying to eat a lot more like that, like eating elk and caribou and not as much um, factory farmed meat, but we still do consume a fair amount of meat. And I got chickens in my backyard, so I'm just collecting eggs from them. I've been doing things like of that nature, right? Trying to source the animal products I'm using in a from a better way. Yeah. But so this I for me, and, and I think the culture up here as well, it's a big hunting culture up here in the Yukon. There's a lot of people hunting moose and things like that. So to try to tell people here to not eat animal products, it's gonna be a very hard sell. And even for me, and I, I'm not even, I'm not a big hunter or things like that, but it's a difficult idea. And for me, I've tried going semi, just for days at a time trying to go vegetarian and it's very difficult i i get cravings i think perhaps i i need i could get better at using things like chickpeas and lentils and things to supplement that protein because maybe i just wasn't doing it in a good way um but it's just it's a hard idea for me to to latch onto and go okay no more animal products that that would be very challenging for me 
Well, again, you know, I mean, it's always, it depends to what degree you want and need to take things. Mm -hmm. Because when you are at a point where your body has broken down, where you have actual health issues, right, and your bowels aren't working properly, and you know, whatever, I mean, any health issues that you have, at that point, you do have to go as radical as that in mm. order to re to bring back balance to your body by removing obstruction. Right. And then afterwards, you know, like for me also, there was periods where I was very, very strict with that. And then now I find I can play a little bit. And at the same time, I also realize that when I do have animal protein, it does slow me down. Mm. And I realize more and more that I only really have it for an emotional attachment hmm. and that actually my body functions perfectly well hmm. better without it hmm. but i mean not you know not to poo poo the emotional attachment because we are beings that also work on emotions right. and so sometimes there is there is a there is a um, uh, you know it's important to also satisfy your emotions when you do so with awareness. Hmm. Yeah. So I mean in your case, you know, where I do agree you're living in a in a in a completely different environment and climate. Um so maybe what I would recommend to somebody that lives in your area, I would say another great thing to do is to move away from consuming breakfast. Hmm. Which obviously we've all been taught that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Mm -hmm. When in reality our biorhythm, our circadian rhythm is such that until about 11 o'clock, 11, 12 o'clock, our body is actually in detoxification mode. Hmm. So it's in elimination mode, just naturally. Right. And we do not want to suppress the elimination mode by basically ingesting foods that are going to bring that elimination mode to a halt because that's like extinguishing this fire that the body has created mm. in order to get rid of toxins. Right. So eliminating breakfast, you know, I always say if you're going to do one thing, <laughs> eliminate breakfast <laughs> or rather delay your breakfast and break your fast mm. at around 11 o'clock. Right. You know, maybe you start 1030 and then you slowly move it out until 11, possibly 12 o'clock. And then already, if you just do that, so if one were to do that and then eat really pristine wild animal products and then otherwise a lot of greens, mm -hmm. non-starchy greens like broccoli, like spinach and, uh, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of high water content vegetables like cucumber and celery. Mm. So if that forms your, your bulk of food. And then if you have a little bit of non-mucus forming grains like quinoa and spelt and teff and millet, mm. then unless you have health issues that are present, you know, you are on an amazing diet. Hmm. Okay, I see. I mean, that's something I can get on board with the, yeah, the skipping breakfast thing is something I we've, like I think I mentioned earlier, we're sort of thinking about doing that anyway, sort of having a, yeah, intermittent fasting is what people call it, I think, where you just, you, right. you delay that first meal. Only that intermittent fasting is you're still consuming um, drinks, whereas mm. I would advocate to dry fast. Oh, yeah, that's so what I was thinking consume. is maybe a green tea, but you'd say don't even do the green tea or coffee. Don't. Definitely mm. not coffee because mm. coffee acidifies the system mm. and it depletes your adrenals. So again, you're sort of, you know, you're taking away, you're depleting your body. So with mm. everything that you consume, uh, another really important thing to consider, it's kind of like step away from the concept of vitamins and protein and carbohydrates Okay. Um, and focus on is the food that I am taking, is it high in, in, nutri in nutrition? So is it high, especially in minerals? Hmm. Because we are an electric body and minerals is what fuels the antenna hmm. and makes for condu conductivity in the antenna. Okay. So the more minerals we have running through our body, the better the electricity, the energy of 
the planet will run through us. That's interesting. And the better of a conduit. Okay. Never yeah. heard that idea before. That's cool. Yes. Mm. So mineral content is what you're looking for. The other thing that you're looking for is that you will need to ask yourself is the food that I'm consuming, how much does the food that I'm consuming carry out waste of the body? So, for example, mm. when I'm consuming an apple, the apple has fiber. Right. And we know that fruit is the scrubber. So right. it will actually act as a scrubber and a broom and it will carry waste out of the body. Right. When I consume a steak, no matter how pristine it is <laughs> yeah. and how wild, it's not going to carry anything out of the body. Mm. But we know that by nature, it will leave a residue. So that's the question number three. How much residue, how much waste, how much obstruction does the food that I consume leave behind in my body? Right, yeah. And so oftentimes people will say, oh, but, you know, I follow the paleo diet mm -hmm. or ketogenic diet yeah. and, you know, hunter-gatherer, da 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 da, -da. <laughs> Yeah. And it's like, sure. Yes, if you were to live out in nature and you were to go and hunt for your own food and you were to really have to nourish yourself the way mm. that it used to be, right? how often are you going to go out and kill an animal versus how often are you going to run into the Garden of Eden <laughs> and pick fruit? Right. Or if there's no fruit, you know, if you have your choice, are you going to go and, I don't know, eat berries or leaves or carrots or whatever basically grows easily? Or are you going to every single day go and hunt and kill? Hmm. Yeah, right. You know, so it's kind of like using if you really want to go the route of hunter gatherer, if you want to use that analogy and you identify with that, then still you need to realize that those people were not eating protein three times a day. No. And that they were most likely they had periods cycles where they would eat a lot of protein because yeah. there were no fruit growing yeah that makes sense to me yeah, yeah. cuz i mean you can like they would you can kill a, a large animal like a buffalo and that will feed uh, a group of people over a period of time but i think it probably is true that it, something like that would be more in cycles and more periodically it wouldn't be a constant supply necessarily right and also, there were no nice sauces to go with and salt <laughs> and flavors. Yeah. You right. know, so how much were these people really eating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. It's, it, I'd like to try it. I think, so you think if I, say, were to do sort of that m the morning fast, I suppose, and try to eat in that way, or just, just consume more vegetables, more fruit in general, um, is what I need to also do you think, I mean, I guess need is sort of a, you know, it's, it depends what I want, I suppose, but would you recommend also doing longer term fasts and things like that? Or like doing like enemas? I know you've talked about that or. Yes. I mean, definitely enemas are a big one and I have people fight me over it all the time. Mm hmm. <laughs> and it's usually a deal breaker for people yeah. when they hear, you know, they love everything I have to say. And then when I go, okay, and we're going to do animals. Ah! <laughs> yeah, yeah. I Not can that. understand that. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I've guided enough people to know that pretty much everybody falls in love with doing enemas. It sounds silly, <laughs> that right? but that is what happens. Because it feels because good. once you start seeing what comes out of you, mm. how much stuff is literally stuck in your colon. Mm -hmm. Nobody believes it until they see it for themselves. Nobody. Mm. Yeah, I've never done it. I've never done that. But I, yeah, I'm curious. <laughs> I'm curious to see. It's, it's unbelievable what gets stuck in the colon. Mm. And, you know, some people also, they don't like doing enemas. So then they go for colonics, even though obviously enemas are a cheaper because you can just do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. Colonics are also great. They do go deeper. And certainly when you do go for a colonic and you see what comes out of you, 
Like if that's not enough to motivate you mm. to really clean your colon out, yeah. then nothing will. And at the same time, the feeling that comes with releasing all the stuck matter from your colon, mm. which we mustn't forget our colon and gut is, is linked to our brain. It's linked mm. to our immune system. Right. You know, so it is all, it's all linked. Yeah. And it's so interesting. Oftentimes when people start doing enemas, like for example, I mean, it's a silly example, but it's funny. Mm -hmm. When my husband gets all grumpy and irritated because he's doing the fast or, you know, whatever. Yeah. I say, you know what? Just go do an enema, please. <laughs> Just go now. <laughs> what? And he'll yeah. go. You know, like you, and I say, you're full of shit. Just go do an enema. <laughs> hmm. And so he'll go and do the enema and he'll come out and he'll be a different person. Hmm. Light, in a good mood. Releases you know, so something. It's, it's eh? such a, yes, you release. And oftentimes I had that not so much now because, you know, I feel like I've released so much. But in my early days of doing enemas, I would literally have very strong emotions or me old memories that would come up while I was retaining the enema. Hmm. And I would think, gee, I haven't thought about this old hurt or trauma in ages hmm. or this memory of childhood or whatever. And then I would release it and I'd feel amazing. And so that is because emotions are trapped in our tissue. You know, like, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the term, the issue is in your tissue. <laughs> no, I haven't. But I have heard that, that we do, and it's a funny idea, but that we store feelings, emotions physically as well. A hundred percent. So we, I mean, again, you know, um, we all know that water stores information. We are 70% water, mm -hmm. plasma, but water. And so that is where we store in, in the water of our body, which every cell contains water. That is where our emotions are stored. Hmm. And, and then obviously it's distributed in different parts of organs and tissue. For example, our fascia. Have you heard of fascia? Mm, no, I don't think so. So fascia is basically, I'm sure, well, obviously you've, you've skinned a chicken mm -hmm. and you know, that very thin, uh, white, almost see-through skin. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That is basically, we have that too. It's, mm. it's so thin and yet it's actually quite tough. Right. It's kind of that stretchy. That is fascia. Yes. It's kind of a connective tissue that holds the muscles in place okay yeah to the bone and so we have the same and up until i think 20 30 years ago um or maybe 40 years ago now the medical community used to just when they when they did examinations of the body they used to just chuck that away and so <laughs> think oh well what is this we don't need this hmm. meanwhile that is the connective tissue that is the stuff that keeps our muscles in place and it keeps everything sort of together Every trauma is stored in the fascia tissue. And so I've, I've learned how to do fascia or trauma release massage. Mm. And if I massage your fascia, there are places where you will scream mm. in total disbelief of pain, <laughs> right. even to the point of feeling like you want to retch. Mm. And old memories come up and you think, how is it possible? Right. Now I've heard this. This little woman is massaging me in this spot where <laughs> I would have never thought there's pain. And yet I feel like just killing her because it's so sore. Huh. Yeah, I've, I've heard this because... in another way. I've heard, I've heard someone else talk about, not, they didn't bring up the uh, fascia, but talking about uh, doing a massage for someone in a way that help them release things and i think she she would mention some people would burst into tears and some people would burst into laughter like repressed laughter in them yeah similar yeah repressed emotions or things yeah yes absolutely i mean that's the thing we store our emotions in the body and then the stored emotions 
become a part of the way that we operate from or the way that we move from. And that's why oftentimes, you know, you, you can tell the way that people feel by simply watching them move in the body. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I like that actually. So I want to touch on a couple things. The only thing that makes me think of is just I personally, I really enjoy communicating with people more um, when we can move around um, in person. I find one of the most uncomfortable things for me just personally is like being stuck at a say at like a dinner table for a long period of time where everyone is just stuck sitting and trying to talk yeah. to each other. And I find I can express a lot more and sort of connect easier when we're able to move around each other and that you can express Absolutely. a lot of, and, and read a lot from someone in the way that they move. And yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, but one thing, so I do want to touch on an idea I had thought about a lot um, in sort of preparation for talking to you and thinking about something I've talked to a lot of people about is, is healing um, in lots of different ways. I've talked to a lot of people who help heal people with psychedelic medicine or drugs. Um, but I've thought a lot about the idea that healing in general is sort of about release and being able to release things out of you. And that could be emotional things or it could be purely physical things. You're like, we're talking about detoxing, but just the idea of like talk therapy, the reason like counseling can work for people is that I think by being able to put even just language to stories or ideas or emotions that are within you, you're able to release them by just speaking them. And that's even a release and that it's this way, it's this thing that for people to move on from something or move through or past something, they have to expel it out of their body because we're always taking things in. Like you talked about earlier, physically, we're just constantly consuming things. We're thinking more, 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 but we have to get better at expelling things out of us. And it's like these psychedelics seem to have a place for helping people do that sort of, uh, you could say mentally or spiritually or emotionally, um, yeah. I would say on all levels, um, I find talk therapy can be useful for sort of very beginners, mm -hmm. you know, when people are really shut down and they've never done any work on themselves, Yeah. then talk therapy can definitely be useful as a door opener. Yeah. But ultimately, I have found, you know, I got to the point where talk therapy was doing nothing for me because with talk therapy, we <laughs> can fool ourselves yeah, sure. and the therapist. Yeah, we can say all the right things. Yes, because the mind, the mind, the <laughs> ego loves, you know, and especially an unaware and unconscious ego can fool. I got so good at fooling therapists for years <laughs> and I didn't realize what, who was I fooling. I was fooling myself. Right. Yeah, sure. So maybe we can talk a little bit about the work that you've done, the experiences you've had with things like uh, mushrooms. I've had, I would say, you know, I always say I've had some of the most profound experiences of my life and some of the most profound realization and transformations through psychedelics. And you know, I don't, I mean, I not, not, I don't think I know hmm. that I would never be where I'm at today without them. Hmm. So how did you find them? How did they, how did they come to you and how did you use them initially? And how have you used them in recent years? Cause I, I think I have the impression that you've worked with them with other people, like as, yes. as sort of a facilitator or host of the process right i do work with individuals only in very very small groups typically no more than two or three people mm -hmm. um i came to them you know it, it's interesting because i was like in school and later in university i was your classic goody goody girl okay like as in you didn't you know, really do drugs or things yeah, I didn't do drugs. I didn't really drink alcohol. Like I tried mm. to to fit in. Mm -hmm. You know, I did my best to kind of fit in. Yeah. But it just never suited me. I I never even really got it. Like, why do people get drunk and act weird? Like for <laughs> me, that was just it didn't work. Right. And so it's not like that was an entry point for me. 
and only much later when I started to really do deep um, spiritual work on myself and when I had my so-called awakening in my mid-twenties, mm. I started reading the books of Carlos Castaneda okay. and, and you know, that sort of, um, Shamanism and sort of shamanic. Of yes, I got into shamanism. I found the books of shamanism. And so I got, I approached the medicine world from that perspective. And I'm actually so grateful that that was my entry point right, yeah. because it, it felt like my entry point was using these plants from a really deeply reverential and sacred, uh, perspective. Yeah. Like at least you had that respect early on. Well, well, huge. Using them. Huge, yes. And then, you know, looking back, I mean, I always, I always had a very deep love and passion for plants in general or for botanism. Like there mm. was something that kept drawing me in. Right. And, and so definitely, you know, that was, I think already the plants were speaking to me. Like I saw mm. them always as sentient beings, as, as beings with deep, deep wisdom. I didn't know it at the time, but <laughs> right. then once I started working with these teacher plants, I realized, wow, you know, they have been here way before humanity. And so, of course, you know, and in particular mushrooms, I mean, the fungi family is right. ancient, you know, mycelium. I mean, that's really, it's sort of like, that's the beginning of time. And of course they carry the information from the beginning of time and how they show us how everything is interconnected. Yeah. And so on one hand, they show us our infinite magnificence and they also show us our littleness <laughs> yeah, and yeah. how, you know, us humans who think we are the king of the jungle, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we are superior to everything else. And meanwhile, it's like, you are just, an incredible part of the symphony hmm. in balance. Right. And so, so you use them and, and came to these sort of discoveries on your own early on. And then when you work with someone with them these days, what sort of a uh, practice do you have? Do you s sort of, um, do you still follow uh, the, the readings you did early on? Like, sh shamanistic type of things like do you set up a ceremony with people yes yes typically we well typically always we set up a ceremony and you know i now i find i work very intuitively with them and i don't really it's just they are i feel they are so part of me that i i purposely don't make a big fuss about them right yeah that makes you know, sense to me, yeah. So I try to keep it as kind of normal. I, I, I like to normalize them. I mean, as much as, yes, I have deep reverence, mm -hmm. but I also normalize them because to me there is no difference between the sacred and the profane. Like everything mm. has its place in, in our human experience. Right. And so... You know, and, and then obviously I'm I'm guided by the person that I'm working with. Right. So sometimes it can just be a ceremony, which is my preferred way of working, is to really just be the space holder. Right. And to allow the person that I'm working with to have their own deep experience without any interference from my side, because I actually fully, fully trust the medicine. You know, I'm just there because I have worked with the medicine for so many years that I don't fear whatever arises. Right. You're sort of there as support. And that's really my only role. Yeah. Well, that's cool. That sounds like a good way to do it. And I think I've talked to people recently who also work with mushrooms and, and um, use ceremony. But I think people are more and more going in that direction of, of having it a little more like doing it in an open way that's inviting and not making it too big of a crazy deal and, and putting too much, um, too much into exactly the, how you do it. It's really, there's lots of different ways to do it that people can develop lots of techniques and things that work for them and that it, that it's all 
equal. It's all okay. You don't have to wear a certain robe. Yeah. You don't have to sing a certain chant. You know, these things can be used in lots of lots of ways. Completely, completely. And then it's always it always goes back to the wisdom of the plants. They know and everybody will have um, the experience that they need to have. And, and I sort of found the most important part of holding space for somebody is to really just be there as a presence to hold space in whatever way is needed and to just trust the process. Right. And every time is completely different. Yeah. Okay, well, I know we've already gone over an hour and you don't have a whole lot of time. So, I mean, we can wrap it up. Is there anything else you'd like to say or promote uh, before we go? How could people get in touch with you or find out more about uh, your work? Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, people can find me on Facebook. I'm, I'm setting up my web uh, page finally. Hmm. I, I, I sort of, in that sense, I'm quite resistant or have been quite resistant uh, to formalize my work. Mm. Because I like to keep very, very liquid. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I find now, you know, the time has come to sort of formalize it because people like to see, well, you know, what's your web page? What are you about? <laughs> yeah. And so it's 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 about to to be launched. Cool. But I'm on Facebook as Alexandra Schwen, which is my maiden name. Mm. And um, I'm on Instagram under Living Mucus Free. And so you can just contact me and, you know, if you resonate with my work, I do deep one-on-one -on -one work and then I'm also starting to do more of group coaching and sort of, you know, bringing a little bit more uh, structure into the way that I work. Mm. And I, like, I really enjoyed just uh, seeing what you're putting out on Instagram. That's generally how I get a lot of uh, the stuff from you and you put out quite a bit. I would say it seems like almost daily you're, you're putting out uh, new messages and new things, so... Yeah, thanks for the work that you're doing. I really, I really like it. Thank you. Yes, thank you for yeah for having me, and yeah. thanks for your openness. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Alex.